Hello, everybody. My name is Alexandre Marra. I'm professor of the postgraduation strict science program in health sciences in Albert Einstein Institute Israelita de Ensino e Pesquisa. And also, I'm a researcher at the Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein. I've been researching at the University of Iowa Internal Medicine Department in Iowa City, Iowa for seven years. I'm really excited to introduce the 11th presentation in the Einstein Connection series of guest speakers. This is the first presentation of the year 2023. Einstein Connection is our international program that intends to connect Brazilian researchers, students, healthcare personnel with international professors and international researchers. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Gonzalo Berman. Professor Berman is the chair of the Division of Infectious Disease, Richard P. Wenzel, Professor of Medicine. Dr. Berman is also the editor in chief of Antimicrobial Stewardship and Healthcare Epidemiology, Ash Journal, Cambridge University Press. I have been honored to have Dr. Gonzalo Berman as one of my mentors at the VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, when I had my fellowship. And it's been rewarding to collaborate with Gonzalo on a couple of research projects and work together in Ash Journal. You talk to us about your beautiful experience as an editor in chief of ESHI and about the leadership and your successful story as an infectious disease hospital epidemiologist. We have a plan for Dr. Berman to speak for 30 to 25 minutes, after which we will have 15 to 20 minutes to answer questions. You can unmute yourself and ask your questions after Gonzalo's talk, or you can type your question in the chat. I'd like to ask for all of you to answer the survey at the end of the presentation. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Gonzalo Berman to start. Please, Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Greetings, uh, Dr. Mara. Professor Mara, thank you so much for such a kind introduction. It's a huge honor to be with all of you today. I guess I'm going to close my eyes and pretend that I'm in Sao Paulo with you in Brazil and not here in Richmond, Virginia. So we're together in spirit at the very least. So. What I'm gonna to cover today is probably a little unusual for a scientific presentation, or that's what I've been told. And it deals with leadership in infection, infectious diseases, healthcare epidemiology, antimicrobial stewardship, but really from the perspective of football or football or the sport. Uh, so let me share my slides. Give me one second to get that going and we will get started. So can everyone see my slides? Alex, can you see that? Good. I'm going to do that. Move that over. There we go. And minimize this. OK, so again, my title is Leadership in Healthcare Epidemiology, Antimicrobial Stewardship, and Medicine, a Soccer or Football Enthusiast Perspectives. Really, with a subtitle is Lessons Learned from a Lifetime Playing, and really probably more watching soccer than playing soccer. So let's move to the next slide. I'm moving here. I'm having some problems. Here we go. So here are the disclosures. I have prior research grants from various pharmaceutical companies. I'm also the editor-in-chief of Antimicrobial uh, Stewardship and Healthcare Epidemiology, and I have grants or research grants from the Virginia Department of Health and a foundation grant from the AO Orthopedic Foundation. So those are my disclosures. Another disclosure, I was neither a professional footballer nor a manager. Uh, I was, uh, still am a footballer or a soccer player. Uh, I played uh, competitively in university as a goalkeeper, and I played at Colgate University, and I still try to play, and I watch the game a lot, and I consider myself more of a student of the game than not necessarily an expert in the game. Regardless, you can still learn a fair amount if you pay attention to the many of the nuances in the sporting world. In this situation, it's football or the beautiful game. So for those of you who think that sports are not important, I would encourage you to look at this book, which I believe is in, uh, available in multiple languages, including Portuguese, the title is How Football Explains the World by Franklin Four. And to quote uh, uh, Mr. Four, he writes that soccer isn't the game the same as Bach or Buddhism, but is more often deeply felt than religion and just a much a part of the community's fabric, a repository of traditions. In other words, it has deep uh, kind of social meaning uh, and personal meaning to many people around the world. So the first lesson I'd like to cover, and by the way, we're going to do 10 lessons in this discussion. Lesson number one is that win, lose, or draw, there's almost always another match. 
setbacks abound, burnout is always a threat. So I'm gonna start with this. Now I apologize, I realize I'm speaking with a Brazilian crowd. You should know I'm from Argentina, so I'm partial to Argentine football. You know, we're not gonna talk about Pelé, Maradona, Messi. Let's just assume that they're all great and we can all agree on that. They're great footballers and each one of them has had beautiful impact on the match. But with that in mind, let's talk about perseverance, resilience, and grit. I'm gonna use a quote from Lionel Messi who said, I start early and I stay late day after day year after year. It took me 17 years and 114 days to become an overnight success. You have a picture of him in 2014 after we lost the World Cup in Brazil against Germany, and then eight years later winning the World Cup. To get to that, it takes a lot of effort and grit. But let's go on a little further. Perseverance and grit is important, and to use the example of Messi, we can learn some lessons from him as from this uh, paper or this article that was published online. He was born to a working class family in Rosario, Argentina, he was diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency as a young boy. He was invited to the famed Barcelona Youth Academy, La Masia, at age 13. You know, the club agreed to pay for his medical treatments for growth hormone. And the real thing that was important here is that he resist, resisted family pressures and homesickness to return to Argentina. You know, he really stayed with it. For that, it's a triumph of individual grit, which grit is toughness, coupled with an organizational environment. So what I mean by that is organiz organizational support is critically important. And here are the five pillars of La Masia, which is the football academy of FC Barcelona. And they are humility, effort, ambition, respect, and teamwork. So with that, long-term success starts with an organizational focus. Now let's talk about medicine for a moment. We all know that uh, the tears, nightmares, exhaustion, essentially burnout is now the new normal for hospital workers, not just in North America, but really worldwide. So we are really feeling the pressure of the, the pandemic and infectious diseases in this review of infectious disease providers, at least in the United States, uh, had were the least happy with their, uh, with their profession outside of work. Only 45% of infectious diseases were happy, uh, specialists were happy as, as per this survey. What contributes to physician burnout? Well, the, the, uh, the drivers of burnout are multiple. A lot of them have to do with spending too much time on bureaucratic tasks, maybe too much time at work and lack of control or autonomy. I'm not gonna get in, into this in too much detail, but there is this reference here for you that want to explore it further. So let's look at physician burnout and healthcare epidemiology. We actually published a paper on this with Susie Hoda from the University of Toronto and Dr. Sarah Hessler from, uh, the, from the University of Massachusetts Bay State Medical Center. And really in healthcare epidemiology, there are unique drivers of burnout and we may have, we may actually be driving burnout in colleagues by you know, demanding that they wash their hands, that they wear hand hygiene sensor badges, that they follow checklists and protocols and timeouts, et cetera, et cetera. In this particular paper, we argued that research is needed to assess the driver's prevalence and solutions for burnout in healthcare epi, and that research is needed on the perceived impact of infection prevention strategies on healthcare worker burnout. With the goal here is to define the best practices for infection control to have the minimal collateral damage on wellness and burnout on not only ourselves, but certainly on our colleagues. But let's take it to another level. Let's look at, uh, the, at, at the meta-analysis of burnout across multiple medical specialties. And this is interventions to prevent and reduce physician burnout, a systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2016. It's basically 15 randomized controlled trials and 37 cohort studies. It's a combination of individual and organizational interventions that are really highlighted, which include mindfulness training, stress management, small group discussions, duty hour reductions, and workload work reductions. So with that, the summary is that individual and organizational interventions can reduce physician burnout by 10%. In other words, if you try to do one by self, you're probably not gonna have the maximal benefit. And this was published in Lancet in 2016. Organiza organizational strategies, much like La Masia and FC Barcelona are critically important. To highlight an organization that's very successful in this, I want to highlight the Mayo Clinic in this particular paper that was published in 2017. Mayo Clinic physician burnout is currently approximately two thirds of the rate of that nationally, of 32%, 33% versus 49%. And they have strategies which include acknowledging the assessing the problem, harnessing the power of leadership to make change, targeted or developing and targeting, uh, implementing targeted work unit interventions, cultivating a community at work. So it's not just work, it's a community and extended family using rewards and incentives wisely, aligning values and strengthening culture, 
promote promoting flexibility and work-life integration, not necessarily balance, but integration of work and life, providing resources to promote resilience and self-care, and of course, facilitating and funding organizational science to really assess what they're doing and to improve on outcomes and, and really share that with others. So really a culture of excellence within that institution. But with that in mind, individual factors are still important. So with that, let's go back to Rose Lavelle. Well, let's introduce Rose Lavelle. Rose Lavelle is an American footballer for the women's soccer team. Uh, she scored a beautiful game-winning goal or a beautiful goal in the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup uh, final. You see her scoring this uh, amazing goal against the Dutch in the final. And she has a great quote that I like to use here. She writes, or she, is, she has stated, to excel, you have to, you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable and be willing to respond to adversity, which brings me to the concept of grit. Now, this book may be also be available in Portuguese. I believe it's been translated in multiple mm -hmm. languages, and it's titled Grit by Angela Duckworth, and the, the subtitle is The Power of Passion and Perseverance. Grit is the predictor of success. Grit is passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Essentially, grit is a concern about an ultimate task or, or goal, a goal that you care about so much that it organizes and gives meaning to almost everything you do. And really, grit is holding fast to that goal when you fall down, even when you screw up, and even when progress toward that goal is halting or slow. So sticking with it despite all the setbacks. Resilience is a skill, and resilience can also be learned. There are five tips to recharge, or really not just endure, there's a nice publication by Harvard Business Review on emotional intelligence and resilience and some major approaches to becoming more resilient and really cultivating your resilience is learning to be more compassionate, learning to compartmentalize your work, learning how to serial monotask. There's really no such thing as multitasking. We can only pay attention to one thing, one time. Taking detachment breaks, which are deliberate in time. Developing mental agility, learning how to pause, observe stressful experiences, really from neutral standpoint or re response flexibility. And of course, exercising mindfulness, such as emotional stability and cognitive flexibility. So beware that grit is something that is innate and as is resilience, but these things can be honed and improved. So leading teams while exhausted, here's some perspectives from healthcare epidemiology and beyond. This is a paper that's currently in press uh, that should be out any day now. When we're leading during times of stress, a multimodal approach to managing teams is required. You really have to strive for an excellence across the team or the dynamic of the team. The goal is stability during times of crisis, urgent versus important, listening to team members and being comfortable with I don't know, being aware of team dynamics, including frequent check-ins to see how people are, taking the pulse of the team that is, beware of both individual and team resilience, and aggressively advocate for system level changes to mitigate stress and burnout. So we've pivoted from lesson one to lesson two. And lesson two is that sometimes agendas are discordant even in the same organization. In other words, we may be on the same team, but maybe our goals are not necessarily the same. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's a very interesting book out there called Soccernomics, The Economics of Soccer. And they have a great quote from the author Simon Cooper and Stefan Szymanski saying, Part of the manager's job is to act as a scapegoat, shielding his club owners from blame. So when things don't go well, they sack the manager and not necessarily the general manager or, or the owner of the team, really the coach or the technical of the team. So where do we start? Well, I would urge you to uh, look, explore this concept of Start With Why, another wonderful book by Simon Sinek. If you don't have time to read the book, no problem, you can find this lecture actually as a TED talk, I think it's 17 or 18 minutes, I highly, highly recommend it. With that, the author asks, it urges you to ask why you are doing what you do so that you're deliberate. This sets the intent for everything. So if we're physicians in public health, infectious disease, antimicrobial stewardship, or working just as a physician, you really have to ask why we're doing what we do and what's part, at least part of the foundational basis. With that, I'll defer you to uh, this particular book called Betrayal of Trust and the Collapse of Global Health by Lori Garrett. It's not new. I think it was published in 1999 or even 2000, in which uh, uh, Ms. Garrett argues that public health is in the central trust between the government and its people in a pursuit of health for all. This includes a healthcare system that follows the primary maxim of medicine, which is do no harm. So with that in mind, for, thus, for those of us in infection prevention and safety, 
healthcare systems that fail to relentlessly pursue infection prevention betray the maximum, the maximum of medicine and of the public's trust. So how does this relate, these the different agendas relate to you know, our lives or our experiences in the hospital? Well, there's a very interesting paper that I referred to frequently that was published in 2009. It's not new, but I think that the truths that are, that are outlined here are actually still valid. And it's how active resistors and organizational constipators affect healthcare required infection prevention efforts. It's a qualitative study using in-depth in phone and in-person interviews across multiple hospitals and with 86 participants. And you can see the participants included CEOs, chiefs of staffs, ICU directors, nurses, frontline physicians, et cetera, et cetera. And the study identified the pervasiveness of really two kind of phenotypes. One is the active resistor. This is personnel who vigorously and openly oppose various changes in infection control practice. These are easy to spot. The ones that are tougher or the, are the organizational constipators, which are mid to high level executives who act as insidious barriers to change. They're tougher to spot and tougher to really call out. The take home message here is that active resistors and constipators were identified in all hospitals surveyed. So despite being on the same team in the same system, you have different agendas and that plays out in sport as in medicine. Now there is no simple way to get past this. We did publish a paper in 2014 pushing beyond resistors and constipators. And it's one of those papers that I don't think anyone really read, but it helped us at least put our thoughts together. And we concluded that there's no single recipe for successfully implementing evidence-based infection prevention interventions. And you're gonna have resistors and constipators, therefore you gotta be flexible, collaborative, and really go for the highest quality evidence, interventions with the highest quality evidence, find the appropriate leaders, champions, facilitators, you know, execute, evaluate, feedback, and re-engage and continue to re-engage. It is a never-ending process. Just like physical fitness, you got to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. So who is ultimately to, um, to, to uh, I wouldn't say blame, but who is ultimately responsible for the, the safety mission of a healthcare system? Well, I would say it's the top level administrators. And we actually we published a paper on this with Rebecca Bokes, an infection control hospital epidemiology in 2019. And it was really titled Averting a Betrayal of Trust. Hospital infection control programs, we argue, are neither staffed nor empowered for administrative oversight. You know, we're not the police. We're here to set collaborative standards and identify barriers to processes and outcomes. In the end, the accountability of both the system and the individuals in the system falls on the leaders or the senior leadership of that institution, much like the accountability of the performance of a football team falls on the general manager and the owners of the football team. So lesson three, despite meticulous preparation and planning, the outcome is never guaranteed. And this is so true in the world of sports and the world of medicine. So I think this gentleman needs very little uh, introduction. Josep or Pep Guardiola uh, is, has been written about and talked about multiple times. It's a very nice book called La Metamorphosis, the Metamorphosis of Pep Guardiola. And in that book, they really, uh, it, it delves into his coaching philosophy and style. Bottom line is, Guardiola is regarded as the most innovative coach in Europe, but he's very clear to state that success is never guaranteed. Despite meticulous and thorough preparation for matches in which every player supposedly knows his exact role, he leaves as little as possible to chance. He's nimble with tactic, tactics and formations. He never has the same formation, it seems. However, with all that in mind, there's a great awareness that outcomes are beyond the control or beyond his control. Once the game starts, there are no assurances. That's because you have your opponent, you have the conditions of the field or the pitch, including the weather, the match officials, and of course, there's always luck and human error which impact the outcome of the game. This gets me to the concept of healthcare associated infections. Now, many individuals feel that zero hospital acquired infections are the holy grail you know, that will someday be the, the aspirational goal. And that may not be necessarily feasible. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this paper that was published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a 2011 point prevalence survey of US hospitals in which 4% of hospitalized patients had a healthcare association, a healthcare associated infection. In 2015, the point prevalence was repeated, again, of survey of US hospitals, and 3.2% of hospitalized patients had an HAI. So there was some improvement, of course, but the risk of having an HEI was only 16% lower in 2015 than in 2011. Not great progress. So really, how much can we prevent? 
So we did write a paper about this. It's actually gotten some, you know, some, some downloads and some people would like to hear this discussion. I have an entire lecture just on this. But the bottom line is we explored the concept of how much can we prevent and how hard should we try? Well, we go back to the first tenet of medicine, which is to do no harm. If that is our why statement, then infection prevention programs should relentlessly pursue reliable, sustainable, and practical strategies for heightened patient safety. Gets us to the next question, how much can we prevent HAIs? And I'm gonna summarize it in this slide very briefly. Is HAIs result in significant morbidity, mortality, and cost that obligates us to act. Getting to zero HAIs is a sound bite. It is not consistent with the current infection prevention science. Why is that? Because infection prevention science is inexact. Even high quality studies have limitations. The processes are inconsistently implemented and that is endemic. Processes can be controversial. If that's the case, then what is the best practice? Diagnostic strategies and gaming can lead to inexact HAI incidents and false conclusions of preventability. And once again, hospital administration is key to achieving safety goals. Fact, keeping leaders focused on this particular objective is a challenge, but it has been in my 20 plus year career. So lesson four, if we focus on the processes, the results will generally follow. Not always, but generally. So perhaps with that in mind, up to 70% of HAIs are preventable. We should relentlessly strive to minimize potentially preventable HAIs. Again, it's consistent with Hippocratic Oath. We look for practical satisfactory solutions in the real world. We advocate for sound policies and improvement in infection prevention science. We strive for decisions based on cost benefit, safety, and we continuously assess effectiveness of HI prevention programs with rigor. So I break it down to this, preventable versus unpreventable HAIs. With the current science, summarizing all the papers out there, perhaps 70% of HAIs are potentially preventable when risk reduction measures or the process of care are reliably implemented. That leaves us at 30%. These are the apparently unpreventable HAIs, which is infection, uh, despite every agreed upon measure for infection prevention being followed, we can't always have the outcome we desire. Which reminds me of a famous quote from a face, famous footballer and football coach, Johan Cruyff, the Dutch football magician and then the manager of FC Barcelona. He has a saying that if you do everything right in a game, perhaps you have a 75% chance of winning the game. Somewhat analogous to 70% of potentially preventable infections in healthcare infection prevention. So like Guardiola and Epictetus, my favorite philosopher, at least for now, be clear on the expectations, don't oversell the outcomes. As Epictetus said, happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within your control and some things are not. So if you're gonna be an infection prevention and a stoic philosopher, be clear on what we can and cannot control with respect to infection prevention. I think we'll all feel a lot better and we'll certainly uh, inform people much more clearly. So lesson five, yes, the win loss draw column or the table of positions is an accurate predictor of performance. This is a reflection on public health reporting of HAIs. So this is an old table now from 2020, 2020 and 2021. Now you're all probably very well versed and understand the game of football. Three points for a win, one point for a tie, zero for a loss. At the end of the season, the team that has the most points wins the league. And this is in this case, it was Manchester City at least in 2021. So in the United States, we actually have healthcare associated infections reporting loss. Now this is a map from 2011. This map is now entirely green, which means I think every state in the United States has a mandatory public reporting of their healthcare associated infections in hospitals that is reported usually through the Department of Health websites and individuals or the public can look into that if they are interested. So if you're gonna do that, you have to put some things or put some thought into it this is a paper that was written by Mike Edmund predominantly, in which I was part of also, but this is really his brainchild. And it's a really well-written paper in which he talks about effective mand mandatory public reportings of HAIs. And to do that well, you have to have a highly accurate data collection, a rigorous standardization of methodology with risk adjustments for units and facilities, minimal excess costs, and an end product that is useful to patients and fair to hospitals. I couldn't agree more with Dr. Edmund. And in this particular, this particular uh, study that I found in American Journal of Infection Control, you basically have a summary of state groups with mandatory public reporting of CLABSI trended toward greater reductions in CLABSIs. It really made it much more visible and it focused 
the health systems, or at least theoretically allow, made the health systems focus more on their CLABC and HAI prevention efforts. So a benefit of mandatory public reporting. So much like the table of organizations or table of positions, I'm sorry, in football, this is the mandatory public, a public reporting of HEIs is a reflection of overall organizational performance. It's a comparison between healthcare systems must be risk adjusted and utilize validated methodology, which is done with CDC and HSN definitions. As I said, to er uh, uh, said earlier, it forces healthcare systems to prioritize and implement infection prevention best practices, and it may result in financial penalties for poor performance. This is by the government or CMS. And this further focuses effort and resources in infection prevention and safety. So lesson six, the best players do not always make the best coaches and other thoughts. So playing is not coaching. So why do so many sporting greats struggle as coaches? This is actually an interesting article from 2017 that is published in the conversation. It's open access, so you can read it on, on your own via the link below. And one of the things they actually highlight is someone like Jose Mourinho, for example, who didn't have a stellar career as a player. I think he was a second division level player in Portugal, but went on to be one of the world's uh, leading football managers. I think that's a bit indisputable. What the author argues is that playing contributes to coaching skills. If you are formerly a footballer, you understand the technical and tactical aspects of the game. Playing experiences, however, only give a partial view of what it is to be a coach or a manager. What's missing is what happens off the pitch, which is planning and preparation, the complex you know, orchestration of commitments across all aspects of the job, the business, managing people, et cetera, et cetera, and the personally challenged reflections and decisions that high quality coaches engage throughout their career, such as taking very, such as making very tough decisions. We'll talk about that shortly. So with that in mind, it reminded me of a paper that I read a long time ago that was published actually in 1999 that is still very relevant. It's titled Understanding Ac Academic Medical Center's Simone's Maxims. Now, Simone was a former department chair of medicine, I believe. And the kind of pre the, the preamble to his, to his paper is, I began years ago to establish personal rules of thumb, maxims, to discern some meaningful behaviors or patterns in seemingly chaotic events and baffling human behavior. So let's explore that a little further. Now, I'm not going to do all the maxims, but I'm going to look at a couple that I think are the most interesting. The first maxim is that leaders are often chosen primarily for characteristics that have little or no correlation with a successful tenure as a leader. Examples include a long biblio, scientific em eminence, institutional longevity, ready availability, a willingness to not rock the boat or to be controversial, or to accept inadequate resources. To quote Simone, he wrote that choosing leaders is not a science, but it is surprising how often management skills, interpersonal skills, and experience are undervalued really in making this choice. So on soccer coaches and leaders in academic medicine, street credibility as a player or as a footballer is desirable, of course. We want respected and accomplished clinicians and or researchers and educators. This is likely necessary, and I would say important, but it's probably not enough, it's not sufficient must have other key qualities, which include vision, communication, organizational and executional skills, understanding the why and the how. Remember, we talked about the why and the how. Awareness, which includes emotional intelligence, and ability to work as a team player for and with the team. So let's transition to the next, which is on team players. Now, I'm going to steal a line from Ted Lasso, one of my favorite, guys, I guess, football series or football shows. Complete fiction, but there's a lot of truth in this fiction. And this is Ted Lasso, the coach, really giving, talking to a star player, Jamie. He says, Jamie, I think that you might be so sure that you're one in a million, that sometimes you forget that out there, you're just one of 11. And if you just figure out some way to turn that me into us, the sky is the limit for you. Well, that's so true. So I want to use a different quote here, and this is Crystal Dunn. Crystal Dunn plays for the United States and won the Women's World Cup in 19, 2019. Uh, she's a midfielder, I believe, and she has a great quote. She said, I want to be known as a great soccer player and even a better teammate. Really important. If you don't think being a good teammate is important, think about what happened in 2010 in the World Cup with France. If you go back to the archives of that tournament, there was a big blow up in the French locker room with Nicolas Anelka being, uh, I guess, not collaborative with the rest and being very critical and not a team player. And it had devastating consequences for him. He was kicked off the team. And then for the team, who 
promptly exited the World Cup, I think, after the first round. So this is an example of non-team players causing strife within a locker room. Gets me the next thing. And a maxim from Simone, or an additional maxim from, uh, from Simone, is that personal attitude and team compatibility, i.e. being a team player, is gr grossly underrated in faculty recruiting. We generally say always recruit the best athlete, or in this case, the best scientist, or maybe the best doctor clinician. But if we do that, that's a bit of an oversimplification. For example, a faculty member may be productive personally, but create an atmosphere that reduces the productivity of everyone else, of everyone else or simply does not collaborate with others in either academic or clinical endeavors, doesn't help out when there's cl clinical needs, when people are sick and need cross coverage, et cetera, et cetera. That's not a team player. My experience, this is my experience as a division chair, is that rifts and rancor appear when an individual is perceived as not a team player. It's probably the worst quality that you can have across a group of physicians or across any group that calls itself a team. So lesson seven, teams are assembled for the individual characteristics of the players, seek the unique talents. And let's refer to this as the 20% rule. So, you know, in football, there are multiple formations, but let's just use the 4-4-2 formation. The manager at this time will choose the formation and style of play, not on the basis of an ideal, but rather on the unique talents of the available players. And these talents include things such as speed, strength, fitness, right versus left foot, reception, dribbling, defensive qualities, tackling, ability to head the ball, vision, awareness on the field, passing ability, leadership qualities on the field, shot stopping abilities if you're a goalkeeper, and then of course, goal scoring ability, particularly for the number nine and the number 10 in the team. With that, I want to introduce something interesting, which is called the Pareto Principle, which is really an economic principle, which I'm applying to this, but it has some relevance and I hope to convince you of it shortly. In the Pareto Principle, they argue that roughly 80% of the consequences or the outputs come from 20% of the efforts. And the argument here is the key is to work out the few things that are really important and the few methods that will give you or you or us what we really need. What does that mean? Well, let's look at this from an academic medicine perspective. This is a really cool paper that was published in 2009. It's a survey of 556 academic doctors with an 84% response rate, which is nothing to laugh at. That's a pretty good response rate. 68% reported patient care was the most meaningful. Then you see others had research, education, and administration. 34% of respondents met the criteria for burnout. But here's the take home message. Remember this, spending less than 20% of time on what's on the most meaningful activities was associated with the higher rates of burnout in the doctors. And you can see the difference here, 54% versus 30%. So what's most meaningful? Well, before we get to that, let me just argue uh, this, that evidence would suggest that physicians who spend at least 20% of their professional effort focused on the dimension of work they find most meaningful are significantly at lower risk for burnout. So keep that in mind, particularly if you're trying to carve out what you want to do as a profession and if you're in a position of leadership and want to keep your team tapped. So with that in mind, in my team, which is infectious disease, we try to cultivate unique talents of the VCU infectious disease team members. So people do are not all general infectious disease doctors and they focus on their respective areas of particular interest, which include HIV care, non-tuberculosis mycobacteria specialized care, transplant infectious disease specialists, musculoskeletal infections, outpatient antibiotic therapy or OPAD oversight, telehealth, medical education of medical students, medical education of fellows, healthcare epidemiology, antimicrobial stewardship, and of course, research and mentorship are very valuable to some, and we make sure that they have those opportunities. So understand what is valuable to your team and fight for it like, like there's nothing else. Lesson eight, the best coaches care personally while seeking the best for the team. Now, this one's a bit nuanced, but I think there's some important themes here. There's some insights on management from conversations with renowned coaches. So I read these three books. Uh, they're in Spanish. I'm not sure if they're available in Portuguese. They're definitely not available in English, but they're important. There's Agan Juego, which is play ball, Palabra de Entrenador, which is the coach's word, and Pelota de Papel, which is the paper ball. And the common theme here is that best coaches manage talented individuals on a personal level while maintaining a functional team dynamic. So let's take a look a little more closely. So Vincente del Bosque, famed Spanish football manager, uh, has an interesting reflection on the importance of caring really both about the team and, individ and the individual. Effect, not 
everyone has equal impact or presence on the pitch. Remember, there's 22 players on a team, only 11 play sometimes. Therefore, the manager must be aware of inequalities to minimize negativity. So this is a quote from Del Bosque that I found in Palabra de Entrenador, or the coach's work. The day after a match, nearly all the starters have a lighter training session. It is the job of the head coach to spend that session with those who did not play, to engage them, motivate them, and maintain team harmony. Really, really important. Why? Because once negativity or lack of value and strife sets in on the team, the coach loses control of the locker room. But once that happens, you have a downward spiral where he or she loses the confidence of the players, the management, and the fans, and we know where, all, where that goes, heads towards disaster. So where can we take this from on a different level that's a little more academic and less, less, um, less sporty? Well, there's actually a very nice article that you can all read in the New York Times. I've got the URL there for you. It's called The Perfect Work Environment, What Google Learned from Its Quest to Build the Perfect Team. And it starts with this important fact here. It said employee-based performance or employee performance optimization is not enough and the bulk of modern work is team-based. So how or, what, how or what makes teams most effective? Well, they studied 180 teams across the entire organization. Well, the conclusions were actually very interesting that the who of the team is really not as impactful. It's the team behavioral norms or that dynamic of the team that is most important. In other words, if the team and the leaders have a psychologically safe environment as the norm, leading the team to bonding, this is most critical for high functioning teams. In other words, leaders encourage and promote honest and compassionate conversations about ideas, challenges, frictions, and everyday annoyances and address these needs so the team stays uh, continues to grow and to move forward. In other words, teams are most effective and work is purposeful, personally integrated, and not just focused on being efficient. Really important message there. So lesson nine, coaches, leaders, sometimes need to make very difficult, uncomfortable decisions for the better of the team and the mission. So this is an example of famous footballers cut from the roster. Diego Maradona was cut in 1978, one month before the World Cup. Laudrup or Michael Laudrup was cut in 1992 before the European ca uh, Championships. And Adrian Rabiot, the Frenchman, was cut in 2018 before the, the 2018 World Cup. And all those three teams ended up winning the cups that they participated in. So these are just examples of talented footballers cut from the team, either due to inexperience, poor team tactical fit, or attitudinal problems. Definitely must have been very difficult to fit decisions for the managers at that time. So making tough choices can be unpleasant. I think we all understand that. With that, it's important to listen to diversity of perspectives, to solicit feedback, to promote inclusivity, and foster collaboration. But even when you do that, you still have to make decisions. So on dis difficult decisions and conversations, uh, these include things such as personal de personnel decisions, such as hiring, firing, and redirecting, giving negative feedback on performance and team fit, and prioritizing program and group needs at the expense of other competing interests. But this is something I've learned firsthand through trial and error. Individuals will often accept the final decisions if the opinions were heard, the process was inclusive, diverse, and transparent. So the final lesson is to, uh, lesson 10 is to reconnect with what inspired you to a career. This is the example of Mia Hamm, the US um, uh, women's footballer who won, I believe, two World Cups with the United States. And she has a great quote. This is reflections on inspiration from Mia Hamm. And Mia Hamm uh, uh, stated that somewhere behind the athlete you've become in the hours of practice and the coaches who have pushed you as a little girl who fell in love with the game and never looked back, play for her. In other words, don't play for the money, don't play for the prestige, don't play for the press, don't play for the notoriety, play for that little girl, play for her who was inspired to be a footballer. So with that in mind, be mindful and reconnect with what drove you to become a healthcare professional. Relentlessly strive to recapture that motivation and energy. When I talk with my team here or with learners or with residents and fellows, and they're having a bad day, I kindly ask them to reflect on what drove them to go into medicine and to reflect on that day when they actually interviewed for medical school or their job and what was driving and motivating them and what they said during the time of that interview. Can they recapture that energy and reconnect with it? That's really important. So in summary, life imitates art and soccer imitates life and work. Lessons learned. 
Wins and losses are part of life in sport. Setbacks abound. Importance of leadership during times of crisis and burnout is critical. You gotta focus on organizational and individual factors, resilience and grit. Organizational agendas may be discordant, both on the football pitch and in the hospital. Start with why for the foundational basis of all action. Beware of resistors and constipators, stay true to the mission. Despite meticulous planning and execution, the outcome is never guaranteed. Be careful not to give people guarantees of perfect outcomes. Infection prevention science is imperfect. Zero infections is a soundbite. On the pitch and in the hospital, focus on the processes, the reliability, and the outcomes generally follow. Perhaps 70 to 75% of HARs are preventable with current HAI science. The table of positions, much like the public reporting of healthcare associated infections, is generally an adequate reflection of organizational performance. Neither the best players nor the most talented clinicians and researchers make the best leaders. Street credibility is, is as important as management and interpersonal skills. Non-team players are potentially the most threatening force to a successful group dynamic. Be aware of that. Teams are selected and assembled on the unique characteristics of the individuals. Therefore, focus on the 20%. As leaders, recognize and nurture and advocate the protected time for the unique talents of the team members. Remember, best coaches care personally about the individuals while seeking the best for the team, which is the collective. Leaders must commonly make tough decisions. You're not always going to be popular, but these can be respected when a diversity of perspectives are solicited and the process is transparent. Last but not least, and maybe most importantly, be mindful and relentlessly strive to reconnect with what inspired you to a career in medicine, particularly when there are setbacks and when you feel that your energy is depleted. So if you like this presentation or want to read in greater detail about it, this was actually published uh, in Infection Control Hospital Epidemiology. It's certainly available, so check it out online. And I would like to acknowledge uh, very important people here. Of course, the VCU Infectious Diseases Team, Rebecca Mullen, administration here at VCU, my assistants, Peggy Andrews, Tanya Murkerson, and Paula Thompson, Dr. Julie Reznicek, Dr. Julian Raybould, Dr. Sangeeta Sastry, Dr. Priya Nori, Dr. Patricia Syme, of course, Dr. Richard Wenzel have been huge influences on me over the years. And I leave you with this quote from uh, Megan Rapinoe, US World Cup champion. It's hard to beat somebody that never gives up. Thank you very much. And I hope you've learned something and possibly enjoyed this discussion. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Terrific talk, a very inspirational talk. And I'm really glad that you are here with us because uh, as I told you in the beginning, uh, Gonzalo was one of my mentors, and I'm I'm very grateful for that because and and and, and that's my first question for you, Gonzalo. Tell us about the role of mentorship in shaping our career because you shaped my career. Yeah, so I think that people don't. I think people under some frequently don't value the importance. The, uh, let me back up. The importance of mentorship can probably never be fully valued. There are so many things in mentorship that are somewhat intangible, but the benefits of mentorship are really twofold. They're good for the student and for the mentor. Let's just call it the student or the learner. A good mentor learns from the student and the student learns from the mentor. In addition, a good mentor is one who doesn't necessarily plot out the way to go or the next steps all the time, but ask the appropriate insight-oriented questions so that whatever project or ideas or growth that's, that is, is sought happens in a way that is um, meaningful and hopefully transformational. So a long-winded answer, but mentors are critically important. And I would argue for those that are, that are listening is that no one got to a position of greatness without mentors. If you take the sporting world, world, you know, Pelé had some wonderful teammates. He had some great coaches. You don't win that many World Cups and score that many goals without having an amazing team and staff and mentors around you. The same goes when you talk about a highly accomplished researcher or clinician. You say, oh, that, that woman has published 200 something papers and has multiple grants. But that man has got a couple hundred papers too. They're all in brilliant individuals, but rarely were those 200 papers written and those studies performed 
or those projects completed without a mentor and an entire team around them. No, oh, wonderful. I totally agree with you. And I'm happy that in the acknowledgement you, you had Dr. Renzo because I was in Richmond, Virginia, 2005. Mm -hmm. We are in 2023 and we still keep working with Dr. Renzo. And this is wonderful. Dr. Wenzel, I think, is a mentor to not just me and you, but hundreds of doctors. And he's one legendary infectious disease specialist. And I think one of the greatest qualities he has is he listens, he asks really insightful questions, and he helps you come to your own ideas or conclusions with his kind of his guidance. And that's really important. Yeah. And, and, and I think that this is a very interesting topic. And here we have some comments in the chat, like congrats, very creatively, the way you approach the topic and interesting view of the topic and congratulations and thank you, Elida and Tatiana. They, they are uh, healthcare workers at Albert Einstein. Yeah. And please, if you have any questions for Gonzalo, you can send me by my phone or by the chat. But I, I have other uh, questions and I, I'm really interested in the beginning, you comment about the burnout because it's a big, a big issue in for every institution, uh, particularly during the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. And you mentioned a lot of good studies, systematic reviews, meta analysis that you need to do interventions and you can decrease like in ten percent or you know more. What strategies have you found to be effective? in preventing or mitigating burnout among healthcare workers and, 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 and including yourself? Well, I think that we have to all conclude that there's no single approach. And if you just say healthcare workers, you have to take more breaks and meditate 15 minutes and you know, take timeouts. Yes, that helps, but that's not enough. Right? Yeah, you cool. have to have an, an organizational focus. And the best organization that I'm aware of is the Mayo Clinic and what they've, what they've accomplished and what they have published is they have a focus which includes not only individual interventions for you know, individual focused uh, strategies, but also a organizational focus, which includes things like you know, work hour limitations, duty limitations, greater coverage, um, personnel to help with mental health crises. There's a lot of things there. And, and actually committing to the study uh, and managing a burnout, that's really important. And that's why I, I use the example of FC Barcelona, right? It's not great clubs like Barcelona, or you can name a club. I don't know which is the best club in Brazil right now. You know, clubs go up and down, but the bottom line is the ones that are most successful, it's not just because of one technical or manager, it's because of the entire organization, right? That yeah. from the very top, they set a standard. We have an academy for young footballers and the young boys and girls that play for us, we're gonna treat them teach them humility, respect, hard work, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to take care of them, understanding that not all of them will become professional footballers, but they can still learn from the entire experience. The excellence stops at, starts at the very top. And it's no, it is no surprise that certain institutions are excellent all the time because they have, they stay steady to that goal of excellence at the top. Yeah. I, and I really appreciate all, all the lessons. I like the way that you presented, like lesson one, two, three. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and I, I, I totally agree with you. And that, that's interesting about this burnout because in 2020, you know, everybody was taking care of each other. How are you? How are you? And now in 2023, <laughs> it's like normal life, you know, everybody working a lot, hard to work. Mm -hmm. He's struggling with COVID-19 and a lot of uh, healthcare workers getting long COVID, you know, and this is a, like, like you said, you need to meditate, but sometimes it's difficult to stop and to uh, ask for healthcare workers doing that, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. The, uh, we need to refocus on, on the wellness of the healthcare worker staff. I would also argue uh, to you, Alex, and to the audience is that that we should look as much as possible for examples in other professions, industries, whatever, to see what they do well to maintain their, their, their team, their staffs healthy. What can we learn from others? That's really important. Yeah. I use a sporting analogy, but you can use many other analogies. 
I totally agree. Please, if you want to ask uh, all those questions, you can unmute yourself or type in the chat. I, I have another question that someone sent me uh, ab about your role as editor in chief mm -hmm. of ASHI. What do yeah. you think are the most promising areas of research in healthcare today? The most important, uh, promising what? Uh, the most important to the most promising areas of research oh, areas. for you're talking for infection prevention and, and antibacterial stewardship. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, my particular bias team is we always want the, to discover the latest, greatest technology that will improve an outcome. I mean, I understand that, but I've always been very interested in how can we take what we've learned and studied and apply it to the real world? And how do we take that application and share it with others so it can be reproduced or even improved? So what I'm referring to here is implementation. And I think implementation science perhaps is not the sexiest and most exciting, but it's super important. Like how do we take these studies, which are sometimes in very controlled environments and have them play out in the real world? And how do we do, a, do that with fidelity and reliability? I'm always on the lookout for high quality implementation science roadmaps so that we can share with others and others can learn. And not just in the in developed countries. It has to be across, you know, globally. So it has to be in low and middle income countries, also developed countries. We're sometimes staggered and tiered as to what will work first, most importantly, in low and middle income countries. And then if you have additional resources, this is the next thing to consider. So I think those are critically important. Hey, I have a question here that they sent me. Uh, people from the pharmacy are you mm -hmm. available to accept international fellows in your department considering pharmacists or you're talking about for them to visit here yeah well i mean a lot of those things can certainly be worked out what we don't have anymore is we don't have funds to like to pay for the the travel and to host them uh, because of the financial situations but visiting rotations can certainly be organized Okay, and, and for yes, uh, for example, like for research, like to spend one year, if these pharmacists get the financial support at Chinese, for example. Sure, I mean, there's as you know, Alex, we've done that before, so it's it's all a a process of bureaucracy, but it can certainly be done. It's never fast, but Great. it can be. We we have uh, some medical students here, and one of the questions that I I like to ask you is what career advice you share with these young professionals? Oh yeah, so I would, I would share that be open-minded. Don't make a snap decision early on in your, in your career that this is the only way to go. Remember, you can make changes in your career. You can come across new mentors that give you new perspectives, be open-minded and remember, Paths in medicine, maybe frequent like paths in football, can be through various different teams and different different processes before you get to where you're supposed to be. There's actually a very nice paper that we've just published in ASHI, and Alex is aware of this, uh, and it's open access and people can get it anywhere. It was by uh, Professor Daniel Sexton, who just is a professor emeritus at Duke University, famed university, famed professor. He talked about his unconventional path to being, you know, an infectious diseases you know, great. So to speak, and it's it's very worth reading. It's only about two thousand words or so. Uh, it gives you the free license to do things unconventionally, seek opportunities, and if a unique opportunity arises, maybe go with it if you can. You might learn something, and it might take you to someplace new. So be open and open-minded, be flexible, and don't always be stuck on the path that you have to take that everyone else takes. Yeah. That makes I sense. I love this paper. I share this paper with Pedro, my son. Yeah. From Dr. Sexton. Pretty cool. And, and, right, and, so. and, and, and uh, thank you very much for, in the end, showing your each paper. And I strongly recommend it for this audience to read it. And, and I can share it. It's open. Uh, Dr. Gonzalo's paper about leadership in healthcare epidemiology and antimicrobial stewardship and medicine, a soccer enthusiast perspective is exactly what you summarized for us today. Pretty cool. And we, we had time for one more question. 
that mm -hmm. I, I liked it very much about the 422 formation <laughs> that you, <laughs> but sometimes it's, it's difficult to work in this 422 formation. What were some notable barriers in your career? Because sometimes you, you are making decisions that, as you said, like a coach. Yeah. So you know the barriers are you're not going to be you're not going to be uh, surprised by this are the finances like we want to expand something we don't have the money to do it so the financial I mean that's that's a universal barrier but let me tell you what I've learned about those barriers that sometimes what I think we need to do isn't necessarily what's needed either by the institution or what's deemed important by the team which makes me takes me to the next level. The next level is find out when you're talking about growth of a team or an expansion, what do the team members value? Fortunately or frequently, those, those values are in line with what the university or the institution values. But you know, if people say, I really value my time with the students, I'm like, well, that's a unique opportunity. We can find you formal teaching roles in the institution. Okay. And that helps with some of the finances because some of the finances now come from the school of medicine and not from the hospital. So that's, that's an example. Um, others want to want to say, well, I really value overseeing an outpatient antibiotic therapy team. In addition to being a, a doctor that does consults. Well, that's an important growth opportunity for that individual and for the healthcare system too, who needs an outpatient antibiotic therapy team. So we do that. And others, others say, I really value antimicrobial stewardship, not infection prevention, stewardship. Great. What do we need to expand that that serves the value of the healthcare system and also the individual faculty member? So the lesson learned is to be nimble with your projects, with your plans, ask what's valuable, not only to the organization, but also to your team, find or meet somewhere in the middle and always seek growth opportunities. And here's the most important thing, team, don't be afraid to fail, exactly. right? You yeah. cannot be afraid to fail. You don't go into the World Cup final being afraid to fail. You go win. And if you fail, you fail. It happens. But you try. Yeah, you're totally right. You need to keep working on that, yes. Uh, another comment here. Oh, thank you very much for your great books that you share with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate This is from Gabriele. It's another pharmacy from Albert Einstein. Gonzalo, we are almost done. We, I loved your talk. Loved it. Uh, we 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 record this and I share with a lot of guys from Brazil. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed a lot your lessons. Uh, Gonzalo is pretty good to work as a team in a team work. He's really creative, innovative. He's the editor. You deserve all the best, and thank you for staying with us in São Paulo, Brazil. We are connected. I know that you are in Richmond, I'm in Iowa, and everybody in Sao Paulo. And I, I think that sometimes we have other people uh, connected in other Brazilian states. I really appreciate you to accept our invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.